I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. So I'd like to make a comment about the meditation and two points. One is the aspect of resting in a state of being, not out of clinging to it or you know, getting contracted around holding it there, just more of a resting in a state of being. The Buddha had the expression, whatever we rest our mind upon repeatedly, that's what takes its shape. So the mind takes its shape from what it rests upon. Neurologically, as we rest in beneficial, wise, useful, skillful, so forth, states of being, they literally gradually become hardwired, in effect, in our own brain. And so a lot of what meditation is about is, is resting. Now, we may deliberately rest in an awareness of breathing in an ongoing way, which helps to steady the mind and draws our attention into sensations and away from inner chatter. That's good. It also brings us into a sense of uh, being in touch with our inner being, our internal sensations, more exactly, through interoception, which is grounding and stabilizing, and also reduces activity in the default mode network toward the rearward part of the brain, where we go when we're daydreaming, spacing out, or ruminating. So it's, you know, that's a good resting place, resting in the sensations of breathing, or simply resting in a sense of open awareness uh, that may have some ongoing in touchness with the body and breathing enough to stay present in open awareness. But otherwise, we're kind of resting as the mind as a whole. Perfectly good. Also good to rest in things like love and kindness or compassion or, as I was taking us toward, a mingling of inner quiet, inner peacefulness with a warm-heartedness, not just a kind of chilly, cool, or neutral inner quiet, but an inner quiet that's infused with benevolence, with, with an outflowing good wishing, well wishing toward others in the world. And the mingling of those two, peacefulness and lovingness, calm and caring, different nuances of that mingling, different language you can use, images or words, whatever kind of works for you. It's kind of, it's really nice. So I'm drawing your attention both to the general uh, notion of resting uh, in meditation and in life in general, and in particular, exploring minglings. You know, you, for you, it might be a kind of calm and happiness or, you know, a, a happy lovingness or other combinations of things. Really nice to rest in. And as we do that, uh, we establish ourselves increasingly in these ways of being and uh, establish them increasingly in us, literally hardwired into us. So I just want to encourage that. Um, and as we're aware of what feels good or it is meaningful about these resting places, which you might also think of as refuges, as ways of being that are refuges for you. As you're aware of um, what's the reward value in them, you know, what's enjoyable or meaningful about them, that increases activity of d dopamine and norepinephrine in your brain, which promotes neuroplastic change. So being aware of what is enjoyable, what is meaningful about these ways of being actually helps to internalize them and hardwire them into you so increasingly they become a trait, not simply a state of being.
for some minutes during a meditation. Good. It's happiness. It's skillful means. Okay. So I'd like to talk about generosity. And traditionally, it's said that as the Buddha moved from village to village and meeting different people, very often one of the very first things he talked about was generosity. And if I can quote here. So the first of these uh, comes from an article by a friend and teacher of mine, Andy Olensky, a wonderful scholar and practitioner. And he points out that the so-called perfections, the paramis, the qualities that are developed fully in an entirely awakened being, and we can develop in ourselves along the way, uh, they're different lists. Uh, there's sort of the original six, which got up, expanded to 10. Um, but the list typically begins with generosity, with giving. And the rest of them are things that in English could be translated as virtue, renunciation, wisdom, energy, patience, truthfulness, determination, loving kindness, and equanimity. So you can see already that the Buddha and the Buddhist tradition and obviously other traditions as well, are calling out the value of generosity really early on. Now, here's a very important point. Um, we can get caught up in a kind of monetization of generosity, that it's entirely about giving dollars to charities uh, or putting money in you know, the cup of someone uh, who's um, you know, not doing well. Uh, and that's the least of it. Think of all the forms of generosity that others provide for you and you provide for them that have nothing to do with money, most of which are actually intangible. The generosity of attention, the generosity of simply showing up with a good heart and good faith. Great. The generosity of restraint not interrupting someone, not raining on their parade, not getting in the way of them finishing their point, even if their point <laughs> is irritating. I don't mean clearly overgiving. I don't mean overgiving. The Buddha never taught that. He um, actually taught about thrift and being um, responsible for what we have and not wasting it or squandering it. Uh, foolishly, uh, for those particularly householders who actually had possessions because the monastics had no possessions, essentially. Um, so there's nothing in this talk about generosity that's about overgiving. And if you come out of a culture or have been socialized in a way that you know, has sort of trained you to focus on giving to others, and much more than being aware of receiving from others, you know, it's particularly important. Uh, to hear what I'm talking about is not yet one more reason why you should overgive or yet one more thing you should do. And that's one reason why um, it's helpful to think about generosity in intangible terms and give yourself some credit. Be generous to yourself in the recognition of the many forms of giving, uh, contributing, sharing that you engage in that have nothing to do with money. Uh, being helpful, being encouraging. I think encouragement and reassurance, genuine reassurance, and not to placate somebody or fix anything in them, but genuine reassurance and also encouragement. These are wonderful forms of generosity, beautiful contributions, and which cost very, very little emotionally to give. It's also true that we offer generosity in tangible ways that again, don't have anything to do with, um, with money. You know, we're, we're helpful to somebody. We let them go first. We let them move into the lane in, you know, just in front of us uh, as we're driving. Uh, you know, we may open a door for them. One of the forms of generosity that's been incredibly helpful to me in this life is people who've opened doors for me. Uh, I would not be with you right now if key individuals, just to name two, James Barrows and Tara Brock had not specifically opened a door for me. Um, I don't think I would be with you today. 
uh, if they had not seen something in me and done that. And I'm forever grateful to them. And I include them in my, my benefactors, uh, as it were, those who have been generous to me. And there have been others along the way as well. So for you, think about how you open doors for people or see good in them. Um, you know, a lot of generosity about that, including the ways that we talk about people in the third person. Uh, I try to keep in mind that there's a recorder of some kind, a video camera that's observing me when I talk, when I tell one person about another person. And, uh, you know, generally I try to uh, speak in such a way that I would not uh, squirm too much if the other person I'm talking about actually saw the recording. Even better, I try to speak in a way that the other person would be happy about if somehow they heard, you know, what I said to the person I'm speaking with. So think about all these forms of non-monetized, non-material generosity given and received. Um, just the most basic form of generosity biologically as we breathe, right? The most fundamental process of receiving into ourselves oxygen given to us by countless green growing things. <sighs> Thank you, plants. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, algae. <laughs> Thank you, forests. Thank you, the Amazon, you know, as we inhale. And then as we exhale, oof, giving them the carbon dioxide, the CO2 that they need for their own metabolism. Whoosh. Received and given, breath after breath. Receiving and releasing, breath after breath. Forms of generosity. It's also true, you know, especially in cultures that are, uh, you know, kind of more monetized. Uh, there's a place for offering uh, in Pali, the language of early Buddhism, or Aki language of early Buddhism. Pali would say dana. Dana is the word that's routinely used for generosity. Um, I appreciate your uh, financial dana uh, to me. Uh, in this sitting group, you can always offer it, and it's always gratefully received. Uh, the Buddha taught that basically we should offer that which gladdens the heart. He talked about before giving, to gladden your heart at the thought of giving. While giving, gladden your heart at what you are giving. And then after you have given, with recollection, gladden your heart as well. And the giving is that which should gladden the heart not that which would exhaust or burden you. So, you know, in the form of, um, you know, Donna, to me, out of your gratitude for this, uh, these teachings and this opportunity together, you know, always only, of course, what would gladden your heart to give. And please always know that alongside whatever, um, you know, financial Donna or donation, it's a donation that you might offer, I'm, incredibly grateful to you already for the donna of attention and participation and the donna of your contribution into the chat sidebar and other comments and you know that really move us along and the donna of your kindness to each other um, quote, here's a second one uh, from um, Jataka 20 it's an early Buddhist text generosity kind words doing a good turn for others and treating all people alike these bonds of sympathy are to the world what the linchpin is to the chariot wheel, connecting it to the axle and enabling the vehicle, including the vehicle of relationships uh, and society altogether to go forward. Generosity, it's very fundamental. Um, you know, I think about the Donna economy, in other words, the unmonetized economy of con contributing, you know, just giving uh, to others. If we could monetize the generosity economy in the world, it would dwarf the monetized gross domestic product of the world altogether, which is $85 trillion a year worldwide in round numbers. Um, so much more generosity and given in all kinds of ways, including the unpaid labor of mothers, uh, homemakers, um, the efforts of all kinds of people, you know, to make a better world, the unpaid labor of fathers on behalf of their children and families, um, 
you know, all kinds of uh, ways in which people tend to their elders, their aging parents. And I've been through that process twice with my mom and dad who are no longer here, bless their memory. Um, just, it's huge, huge, huge. So um, I also want to talk about the aspect of training yourself. Uh, in other words, in the third quotation here, one of my absolute favorites, train yourself in doing good that lasts, that brings happiness. Cultivate generosity, a life of peace, and a mind of boundless love. This is the um, entering quotation in my previous book, um, Neurodharma. I've got another one on relationships coming out in January. And this quotation is the initial inscription because it's so meaningful to me. Train yourself in doing good that lasts and brings happiness. Cultivate generosity, a life of peace, and a mind of boundless love. It's a cultivation. It's hard to imagine a more fundamental guidance for personal training in the broad sense, personal development, the process of awakening, you know, in, in which we take the fruit as the path and, you know, we are enacting increasingly awakened along the way as we progress ever further every day. And so it's a cultivation. So you might ask yourself, and here's where we can get very practical, with one person in your life, Maybe start with someone that's easy for you to imagine. How could you be a little more generous with that person? You know, I think about my long-suffering wife, and I think about, oh, I could provide the generosity of not um, correcting her uh, about, you know, like, for example, when she explains something to me, she'll sort of assume that I'm in a mind meld with her, and she won't tell me what the topic is. She'll just start with the point. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, what, what are we talking about? What's the frame here? And very often this lands on me while I'm working in another room on something else. Okay. So for me, it's a generosity that I've actually tried to get better at about not starting with her rump, but playing the game <laughs> of, oh, <laughs> and usually quickly I can kind of understand what the context is. Um, that you know, that's a little form of generosity. It doesn't mean I deserve a medal. It's just, oh, you know, um, for me, it it's a form of generosity. And you might think of other forms, you know, being a little helpful, uh, doing maybe more than your share of something, uh, offering encouragement, acknowledgement, you know, just support, a murmur of support, uh, you know. What might be an area where you could train in generosity? You know, cultivate it. And as you reflect on this, you might bump up against your own sense, perhaps, of already running on empty, of feeling like you got nothing more to give because, you know, the gas tank is dry. That's a real thing for many, many people. You know, in addition to being traumatized or just really, you know, hammered by life. And so I, obviously we need to name that. And sometimes what this consideration about cultivating generosity brings you to is a recognition that you're kind of fried and you need to live in a more sustainable way, not just in your, with regard to your footprint on you know, the planet sustainability, but in your own life, that you're trying to live the marathon of life at the pace of a sprint. And I need to listen to my own advice, actually. Uh, so you might realize, oh, a little systematically even, you need to be a little more generous to yourself. You need to cut yourself a break, you know, uh, clock out at a certain time every day where you just go, you know, no matter how big that pile of undone tasks is, I'm just clocked out. 
I, I worked in a bottling plant for a couple of weeks as a job in college in the graveyard shift in LA. And, you know, there was a time clock. We punched out. And let me tell you, at the end of an eight hour shift, lugging crates in and out of large trucks, I was glad to clock out at the end of the day. Can we clock out in life? You know, or, hey, no more problem solving. You know, I'm reading my book, I'm watching my program, I'm chilling. I'm clocked out. Whatever it is, it's tomorrow. You know, maybe that's a form of generosity to yourself that helps you be more sustained. So really, please, in the frame of appreciating the value of the Buddhists and others' encouragement to be generous and cultivate generosity, in that context, how might greater generosity to yourself be helpful? In part, because it would fill you up more, so you could be even more generous to others. So, and the final quotation I put in there, just to read it, is, you know, the Dalai Lama um, basically he says, as soon as I wake up, I think about altruism. And he means that potentially abstract word in a very heartfelt sense, as a kind of, how can I be helpful to others? Uh, you know, how can I wish others well? Um, how can I live for the benefit of all beings? Um, not to be exhausted oneself, because we have to be able to fill ourselves up to sustain that life of altruistic um, care. Um, but that's how he wakes up. Um, wow, that's quite a simple thing we could all do. Right? As soon as we kind of get up before we roll out of bed, just slow it down uh, to... Maybe establish yourself in whatever your purpose in life is, as, as I typically do. And then also maybe consider, oh, how can I be of service? How can I be of help? How can I approach others with an open and, and giving heart? Without letting others take advantage of me, without being exhausted or doormat, but how can I enter into this world with a giving spirit? That's a very good reflection, you know, as we get ready to get out of bed in the morning. Now, in a very deep way, the sense of <clears throat> this topic of generosity takes us into a deep consideration, really, of, um, you know, what uh, sort of is underlying it all. But before I do that, I think what I'm going to do is add two quotations. The first um, is in the context of uh, a memorial for Thich Nhat Hanh, the great uh, Vietnamese uh, Zen master, social activist, um, nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, wonderful you know, being. Uh, whose nickname was um, Tay or Tai. And uh, this person, Fred Epsteiner, who's writing a kind of a memoir of him, uh, spent a lot of time with him in the 1980s when uh, Tai came to visit America and met with Martin Luther King, doc Dr. Martin Luther King uh, Jr. and other peace activists and a really memorable US tour. Um, and uh, basically, Tai asked me Fred writes, if I had seen the temple's altar dedicated to Kuan Yin, the bodhisattva of compassion, and I still feel a chill when I remember how he looked straight at me and said, Fred, do you know the best offering to make to the bodhisattva, the transpersonal embodiment of compassion? Do you know the best offering to make? And he then held up his two hands and said, these are the true offerings to give her. In other words, we express our generosity often with our hands in simple material ways. Petting our cat, holding someone in their last hours, um, you know, bringing food, offering food, all kinds of ways, you know, uh, that we, um, you know, are generous to others. Two hands. It's as simple and deep as that. And another form of generosity is summarized in this poem from uh, Miller Williams uh, on compassion. And I love the final lines. 
Have compassion for everyone you meet, even if they don't want it, what seems conceit. Bad manners or cynicism is always a sign of things no ears have heard, no eyes have seen. You do not know what wars are going on down there where the spirit meets the bone. You do not know what wars are going down there where the spirit meets the bone. That's generous too, isn't it? So I want to finish by um, with a couple of um, quotations that I think really speak to the depth of this all and underpin the nature of what we're doing. So to be able to give generously as individuals, it's really helpful to continue to deepen in our practice as the Buddha and others, great teachers in the Buddhist lineage have taught, uh, and others teach in other traditions, to deepen in our felt recognition and our abiding in what is true and what we can recognize directly as true. So first Alan Watts and then John Muir. Uh, Alan Watts, you didn't come into this world you came out of it like a wave from the ocean. You are not a stranger here. In other words, as we have a deepening and increasingly felt and ongoing, at least in the background of awareness, a sense of being the ocean, it's much easier to be generous as the wave. The wave you are, is an expression of the whole sea. And appreciating yourself as an expression of the whole sea, you can allow the whole ocean to flow through you generously out toward other waves. You may not know that they're the sea, right? This is deep practice. It's not some kind of woo-woo, you know, for a bunch, you know, I don't know, for other people kind of thing. This is deep dharma. This is deep truth. And I'm going to share a quote from you in a minute uh, from Thich Nhat Hanh as well that speaks to this. We have, of course, John Muir, the great environmentalist, the great activist, great poet, a remarkable being, had some flaws definitely, particularly in the context of his time, and still he judges words in their own merit. The sun shines not on us, but in us. The rivers flow not past, but through us thrilling, tingling, vibrating, every fiber and cell of the substance of our bodies, making them glide and sing. The trees wave and the flowers bloom in our bodies as well as our souls. And every bird song, wind song, and tremendous storm song of the rocks in the heart of the mountains is our song, our very own, and sings our love. Here too we have this statement of uh, the ground of all and our uh, rootedness in the ground of all, including in, in very primal ways and in very fundamental ways. Um, I'll give a quotation here from Thich Nhat Hanh that relates to this as well. If the deer like to be in the countryside and the birds like to be in the sky, then the practitioners, he's referring to those who are practicing, particularly, particularly in, in this tradition. The practitioners like to be in nirvana. We are in nirvana. The only problem is that we are not able to return to it. In Plum Village, we use the simple example of the wave and the water. In our life as a wave, we struggle and we have fear because we have to go up and down to be born and die, to exist and not to exist. 
we can see clearly that to live the life of the wave is very difficult. But when the wave discovers it is water, then it begins to practice living as water. A wave is and is not, is up and down, is high and low, but water is utterly free. The question is, does the wave have the ability to live its true nature as water? Or must it just live as a wave? A wave can practice living its life as water. Pretty cool stuff, right? And it's okay if there's just sort of a glimmer of the truth of this or something in you that, that moves you in this direction. It's, it's good. It's really good. And for me, it's important to include this level that I'm talking about here and we're exploring here. It's important to include this level alongside what are more kind of obvious, commonplace, maybe down to earth, uh, everyday discussions of generosity. But to be able to sustain our generosity as the wave, it's really useful to have a feeling that it's the whole ocean moving through you. Or to finish here in the last quotation I'll share with you. Uh, this comes from an English uh, monastic who uh, practiced in Southeast Asia. And um, I have the citation here, his book, Uncommon Wisdom, a beautiful book. So he writes, Fundamentally, the element of nibbana, which is Pali for the Sanskrit nirvana. Fundamentally, the element of nibbana, in other words, our unconditioned, original nature, is there within us already. It must be there. If it wasn't there already, we couldn't possibly reach it because nibbana is not subject to arising because it doesn't pass away. The Buddha stated very clearly that whatever arises must cease, which means that Nibbana must be there within us all the time, not arising, in other words, already there. Otherwise, it would have to cease. Otherwise, it would have to arise at some point in time, which is incompatible with its nature of being unchanging. This is one of the coolest, to-the-point teachings I've come across in a while. So cool to just go, cook, cook. wow, that which is unconditioned, that which is timeless, that which is stainless, that which is not subject to birth and death, not subject to arising and passing away, must always be present in our nature already. We may not be aware of it. It must be present in us, as us, we as it already. This is the true nature of Dhamma, teachings. The Dhamma, the teaching in the heart. The heart always experiences a pull in the direction of Dhamma, of truth, this truth. But its pull is not like the pull of a child who must have a sweet right now. The pull of the ultimate truth is a longing to get back to something that we know is real. It's a longing to go home in the true way where everything is just right. And of course, this is an ultimate matter, a deeply profound matter, um, and one that is, of course, of great benefit and support for a life of generosity, as the Buddha teaches. So, um, I'm going to respond to questions, including a great one that just popped in from Gustavo, 21 minutes. Is Nibbana the exception to impermanence? Yes. In the Buddhist teachings, um, well, there's a little controversy about what the Buddha meant and 
beyond whatever he meant, because maybe he was wrong. There's some controversy about what's true. Uh, my read and that of, I think, a number of other scholars and just teachers is that uh, when the Buddha was talking about, as he did routinely, that which is unconditioned or Nibbana, he made a distinction between Nibbana and that which is unconditioned, distinct from the ordinary conditioned arising and passing away of uh, both mental and material st states. Uh, and because they're arising and passing away, they're not a basis for ultimate, enduring, uh, timeless well-being uh, and the highest happiness. Now, there is a point of view that Nibbana is actually some kind of extraordinary, remarkable brain state that is achieved and um, as practitioners encounter it, enter into it, typically after a lot of training, once sometimes just it comes out of the blue, but usually a lot of training, as they return from it, uh, this extraordinary and yet still some, in some sense conditioned mental neural phenomenon leaves a great value behind. That's a particular view that um, you know, it's it's subtle and to articulate it, and there are various people who articulate it really well. That's one view. My own view is that um, as many, many people have described throughout many, many traditions, not just Buddhist, that there is a fundamental underlying timelessness in the fabric of reality uh, that may well be conscious and benevolent. And in, minimally, the Buddha talked about its timelessness, its unconditionality. In other words, its permanence, <laughs> not impermanence. That's, and so beyond all these abstract, abstruse discussions, distinctions, go to your heart. Go to what you experience is true. In you is an intuition of something, not a thing, but could be a mystery, could be an absolute, could be um, a well of not yet being in which the unfolding of reality is occurring? Do you have a sense of that? Do you have a sense of an ultimate stillness, a timelessness? Do you have a sense of perhaps a transpersonal awareness woven into it, even a, a lovingness in it? It's, it's your exploration. But as um, Ajahn uh, the, the, Panavado says, I do think there's something in us that calls us to something more than the everyday ebb and flow of activities. And you can honor that and then see where it takes you without having to form you know, intellectual conclusions about where you're going. What does your heart draw you toward? Okay, other questions, other comments? Aha, so, well, here we go. So Brenda asked a question and I'm not entirely, I, I think some I think some teachers uh, could give a better answer than I'm about to, 22 minutes past the hour. So does this mean that Nibbana, Nirvana, is not only, is, is not only experienced by humans or sentience or consciousness, but the universe itself? Okay, so sometimes there's a conflation of the words or the nirvana and ultimate ground. So is nirvana an experience of that which is timeless and absolute, if there is such a thing? And some argue there isn't, okay, right? That's one way of understanding that. So as and experience is not really even the right word, but it's it's an encounter with, let's say, ultimate reality. Uh, those encounters, and there are other, um, by the way, I should really wanna make a clear point here. In other Buddhist traditions like Zen, there's an emphasis on Kensho or Satori, which is really different than the Nirvana that's achieved through cessation as laid out in the path uh, in early Buddhism. And it's useful to just acknowledge the distinction of those. 
whatever those are, whether it's the encounter that's achieved through the cessation of all or all ordinary states of consciousness, including quite remarkable ones and meditative absorptions, is there simply the cessation and the nirvana you know, of that? Or is there a kind of radical sense of non-dual oneness with everything, which seems to be the fundamental essence of, of Kensho and Satori, et cetera, et cetera? Whatever those are, and maybe there are other traditions that are in much more theistic, in which there's a sense of a, just a like an immersion and an awareness of God or, or uh, the divine or being carried by spirit. Whatever those experiences or human encounters are, that which is encountered by its definition, if there is that which is encountered, is ultimate, transpersonal, not subject to the arising and passing away of these various encounters of it, okay? And just that clarity about the distinction between encounters with ultimate reality and ultimate reality itself, whatever that is, uh, is really useful to kind of cut through uh, certain things. So these encounters um, happen certainly within humans. We have no idea if they happen in the birds and the bees, let alone the plants and the, the algae and the microbes and the viruses. We don't know, you know, uh, or do, you know, the asteroids, you know, somewhere between uh, wherever the asteroids are, Mars and Jupiter, um, are they, you know, popping into Nirvana? I don't know. But more deeply, what's their ultimate nature? What's the ultimate nature of every thought and everything? Right? Um, the assertion of Thich Nhat Hanh and the others is really the deep nature of it all is the the ground of all, you know, in an ultimate sense, and um, it's the ocean. So this is pretty hardcore stuff. It's easy to get lost in the yammer about it. I don't mean to do that. It's just incredibly helpful, though. A to find your own ground, and your and the ground of your ground, and the ground of the ground of your ground for yourself and have that be a refuge for you and a wellspring for you that furthers your generosity. And in a sense, as it flows through you, is a, gener is an, is a generosity flowing through you into the whole world. That's the key. And it's also okay to take some time in this kind of gathering to go after the deepest matters of all. It's okay. And meanwhile, you know, as Jack Cornfield titled his book, After the Ecstasy, The Laundry. And so to come back home again, you might think about one specific way, at least one, and feel free to add more, that you could be a little more generous or maybe a lot more generous to one or more key people in your life or non-human um, beings. How could you be a little more generous and cultivate generosity in yourself? And to do that, how could you be a little more generous to yourself so that you can sustain this marathon of living and so that you're not running on empty and you're tapped in more into deep wellsprings flowing through you? Those questions really bring it home.